the wacky world of Multimedia J. This video today is going to be about closure. A lot of the tech discussions and stuff that I've had over the past uh, week or two have resulted in lots of loose ends that I need to tie up. So this is going to be more of a tech odds and ends type discussion, but uh, yeah, we've got some things to clean up here. First and foremost, I'm pretty surprised that I actually gained subscribers after ranting about Noctua. I thought for I thought for certain that I have a bunch of fanboys jump ship or something. I don't know. Maybe it was the fact that I was pretty level-headed about that whole thing. I don't really like the whole fanboy thing and all of this irrational blowing up in people's face type stuff. So, my terms are quite simple. If Noctua makes something that's not too, too expensive... I would most certainly be interested in checking it out. If I could have like a compelling reason to buy Noctua, maybe the Redux line if they ever go on sale, I would actually buy them. It's not like I'm going to be like super, like, ooh, Noctua is evil, they're super evil, don't buy them, blah, blah, blah. I mean, we learned that lesson, my generation learned that lesson during the 16-bit wars, which are blown out of proportion these days, you know... A lot of people like to say that you know, back in those days it was a big war between Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis, but it was mostly among the companies that were uh, competing with each other rather than anything that we were that we were caught up in. I mean, if I went over a friend's house with a Genesis, I played the Genesis. It's it's that simple. And I'll even say that there were some games on the Genesis that were better than the Super Nintendo, even though the Super Nintendo had better hardware. Uh, the platformer Mickey Mania was a was one example that's another discussion entirely though we're supposed to be doing closure here so let's take another look at this whole Noctua thing level-headed of course now here's the actual press release from when the Noctua Redux series got announced it's still on Noctua's site now I don't know if this whole design in Austria means that these things are shipping out of Europe but this being a relatively uh, recent headline it's June now but about half a month ago or so probably means that we're probably still waiting for ships of these things to start coming in and going through customs over here. So, uh, anyways, if they're coming out of Europe, then, uh, yeah, well, I don't know how, how long that could take, but I've heard of stuff taking as long as four months to ship across the ocean and stuff. I have seen these Redux lines, I have seen these Redux fans on sale on eBay so far, but I'm waiting for them to show up somewhere other than eBay. Maybe see if Newegg picks them up. Newegg already sell, sells the brown knock to a fans, so I imagine they'll eventually have these as well. Here are the actual MSRPs for the for this series, and they're actually not that bad. They look like they deliver on Noctua's promise to lower the price on their fans. So when you consider that my Fractal Design fans float around the 15 mark for a 140, 1990 MSRP isn't that ridiculous. It's nowhere near as ridiculous as 25 to 30. Now, if an Amazon or a Newegg gets a hold of these and puts them on sale and drops that price down even further, we'll be looking at a Noctua Redux that's the same cost as a Fractal fan, and that will definitely be a seller for me. Assuming I want to even experiment with them in the first place, and I don't just stick with all Fractal, I'm really kind of torn, actually, on how, whether or not I want to get a Fractal case, because... It really would be, it would be over $100 unless, it would, actually, even if Newegg put it on sale, it would be over $100. And I could just, there's so much better things that I could be spending that money on. Yeah, sure, Tuxedo's case may be, ob may be an obsolete, no, antiquated, but, uh, yeah. Speaking of which, we got some things to do inside the machine itself, so let's take a look inside Tuxedo after shutting the system down. But that'll be later in the video. Let's do things in a rather orderly fashion here and wrap up some other loose ends first before we start ripping this computer apart again. I also found out that the... You know how they say that time marches on, time flows like a river, stuff like that. You can't stop the march of time. Well, time marches on even for things as mundane as controllers on PCs. I actually found out that the problems I was having with controller support in Steam Streaming and Final Fantasy III on Steam were because of my controller. So this Logitech rumble pad is a perfectly fine piece of equipment here. It still works fine. A little stupid because the thing that this thing spins around is square, but it's got all the buttons of a DualShock and it's got force feedback. It's a perfectly fine controller. However, I purchased it, I actually went and looked it up. I actually bought this thing way back in 2009, so it's got a couple of years on it. So what can happen to the world of controllers in a couple of years? Well, 
stuff like this. This is the basement. This is the base level Logitech that you can get these days. Things like that. What is it? The uh, the F310, probably shouldn't try to read these things through viewfinders. It looks a bit like a freakish cross between a PlayStation controller and an Xbox 360 controller, and that would be because it is. It's got the DualShock format. The sticks, at least, uh, go around in a perfect circle, just like on a, P on a PlayStation. There's a back and a start button. You got the A, B, and X, Y instead of 1, 2, 3, 4. You have uh, buttons that are basically they're made to look like 360 buttons, and these are now proper triggers as opposed to buttons on, on the old controller. So these are now proper analog triggers, and they actually function as analog triggers. And the most important, the most important in terms of feature is this little switch on the back, X and D, that switches it between X input, which is the standard used by the Xbox 360 controls, and direct input, which is the older, more PC standard. So if a game doesn't work with X input, switch it over to direct input. That X input thing solved a lot of problems for me. First, controller bug fix update by S.E. Rossi. Hello everyone, we are aware of a controller bug issue and working on this currently and hope to have this fixed soon. Please bear with us and we apologize for any inconvenience. It's nice to see that Square Enix is actually responding to this Steam bug issue. And that's a good thing, too, because it, it lets me know that they aren't just making sloppy ports and then disappearing. So if they take the other portable, if they take the other, like, what were originally DS remakes, like the, the remade Final Fantasy IV, and they port it to Steam, I will definitely be picking it up now. Long as they don't go, long as they don't reverse course on the whole DRM thing. But it's good to see that they're actually paying attention to this issue. First, let's get all camcorder Let's Play and play some Final Fantasy with this controller. Keyboards. There's my keyboard. I'll leave it down here and I'll just lean way back in the chair and play. Well, after I start the game, of course. So actually, interestingly enough, just getting the newer controller took care of my issues with Final Fantasy, uh, with Final Fantasy 3. So let's uh, see here. Ha -da -ha. Hopefully it didn't screw up my cloud saves. Howdy, folks! <laughs> Yeah, see that? Working perfectly fine in X input mode. Turn that down. Now, here's the interesting part. If I switch this to direct input mode, which is the older standard, as soon as it switches over here. Um, oops. No, that doesn't work. I think it's based on what you start the game in. Let's switch it back. Oops. Yeah, you gotta get this sorted out. Alt F4. You gotta get this sorted out before you start the game. Alright, so let's, um, yeah, so we saw it working. Let's switch it over to direct input mode, the old standard, and let's see if we get the constantly repeating start screen bug. So let's close this out. Let's open this up here. Final Fantasy, da da da, play. Yeah, see? Starting right up, even with the controller in old school mode with direct input. Let's see if the controls work. We already know it works in X input mode. So let's see here. Wait, what am I doing? There, see? It works in direct input mode, too. So... For whatever reason, just getting the newer controller actually fixed this issue. Although I prefer to play an X input because it's the newer standard. One of the nice things about X input mode is that X input mode is based on the Xbox 360 controllers. So, oh, that's right, I forgot I still have these guys with shields. Exit. One of the nice things about X input mode, if we can switch back to it, is that it's similar to the Xbox 360. Actually, no, it's based on the Xbox 360. So if you switch this controller over to X input mode, it will actually detect as an Xbox 360 controller when you're actually playing games that have support for it. <laughs> the single biggest example of X input solving all kinds of problems, and uh, of course acting like a 360 controller, is Bastion, which I'm now playing on the controller without needing to use Joy to Key. With the old direct input only controller, 
with the old uh, with the rumble pad, the old X, which only did direct input and stuff like that. I actually had to use Joy to Key to translate my button presses on here into key presses on the keyboard. But with uh, with this new controller, it basically just works. My favorite my favorite three words when it comes to technology. It just works. You just fire it up like this, and of course you saw the uh, look at things on his way down. He lands on top of a breaker's bow, and it ain't broke. So you can see the suggestions, as well as the controls in the corner, actually have Xbox 360 buttons instead of button 1 or button 2. So you can just pick these up and just go around and play, basically. It's nice when things just work like this. And then he falls to his death. I'm just fooling. Kid better watch his step. Let's let's mess with the narrator. Oh, he just shuts up after a bit. Oh well. Anyways. Kid spies a good perch for some target practice. He knows he should draw the string all the way back. But yeah. When you consider that this game didn't work beforehand, it just plain didn't work. The kid pockets a memento from a breaker, once the fastest man in the land. But when you consider that, I had to use Joy to Key to be to be able to play this game with anything but a uh, keyboard previously. It really says quite a bit, though, about what ex about how even controllers occasionally, hardware-wise, go obsolete. So, hopefully these new Logitechs, well, you know, the Logitechs that I used prior to this one lasted me a few years each, so maybe the maybe this new X input, direct input thing will uh, last as well. The X input thing, of course, being due to how well the Xbox 360 has done, and of course the uh, crossover with PC gaming, because, well, Microsoft does stuff on PC too, so... Why reinvent the wheel? If the Xbox 360, if the Xbox 360 setup works, or even Xbox in general, why not have more crossover between, between Xbox and PC? Not like the Xbox One isn't some kind of uh, small computer to begin with. Anyways, let's get out of this. And for my next trick, I'm going to stream Bastion with the controller. I'm going to actually unplug the controller from the uh, from the main desktop. We'll plug it into the netbook. There we go. So you can hear it. Uh, you can hear it. Doo -doo, out of the crappy little speaker. And we're going to play Bastion streaming from Tuxedo to the crappy netbook with the controller because oops, wrong mouse. Yeah, yeah. We're actually going to do this because just to show that the the whole issue with the Steam streaming controller issues, of course, was due to this was due to not having an X input controller. Currently, the way it works, X input transfers over the network for Steam streaming, but Direct does not. So. Uh, at least that's what it looks like. So here we are playing Bastion on the netbook. Although I don't know. Um, I don't know. Maybe this. Maybe I don't have to stream this. Maybe I can just put Bastion on the netbook, and it'll run natively. I already have fine. Look at things on his way down. As soon as the narrator shuts up. He lands on top of a breaker's bow. Maybe I should turn the sound off. And there we go. We're actually s streaming from Tuxedo right now, as you just saw with me hitting a stream button at the beginning. And I'm actually using the controller. Yeah, see? I'm actually using the controller. You can hear me hit the buttons anyways. Unless my controller sounds like a mouse to some of you. Yeah, but here I am, just playing Bastion with the controller, streaming to Tuxedo. So that's what that's the big thing that Valve needs to take a look at, is direct input commands, if possible, being transferred over the network. As one of the problems that this causes is that I can't play Burnout Paradise, I can't stream it, because that game doesn't have proper X input support. Uh, you actually have to switch the controller back to direct input mode in order for any of the buttons to work. It'll show up when you switch back to X input, it'll show up as the correct pad, and then the, the correct game pad, and then the buttons will all show up as what they are, but you have to switch to direct input mode in order, to, in order for this thing to actually work. So... Some stuff for Valve to take a look at in fixing some of the compatibility issues with Steam streaming.
Lastly, let's end this discussion on closure with some discussions about closure and tying up all the loose ends with Tuxedo. First and foremost, here is here are all those lovely dust filters that I got last time around. 140 mil magnetized sticking to the side of the case, and they can be removed for easy cleaning, just like that. The only problem is because I have a little hack job assembly with all these screws poking through the case, I have to put them at a bit of an angle in order to cover all cover where the fans go in. If I had flatter screws, I could theoretically get a dust a magnetic dust filter that was bigger and not have to line it up with the fan or something like that. But uh, they do impede the airflow a little bit because this little web pattern it's going on as well as the mesh in general. So it, they do impede the airflow. If I can find some magnetic ones that don't have like this star design going on, I'll probably end up doing that. Speaking of uh, modding supplies, I went and purchased a bunch of stuff from Frozen CPU. Besides the rubber gaskets, I also have fan adapters that I'm using for even on fans that that supposedly you wouldn't think would need fan adapters. So here's what I ultimately wound up going with. First problem is I had to disconnect the latch mechanism on the door because I hooked up a 140 millimeter fan with a fan adapter. Yeah, I don't know if you can see it right there, but I hooked up a 140 millimeter fan with a fan adapter, but that means that the fan is now flush against the side of the case. So basically, I can't. The latch was actually causing the door not to close. So I removed the latch. So now you have to literally use the thumb screws to keep the case closed. And on the 140 mils that I put on the side, I actually put a 140 to 120 fan adapter in here to serve as a baffle. Interestingly enough, it actually does improve the airflow a bit because it directs the airflow to uh, directs the airflow to a smaller uh, to a smaller area. And if you actually take one of these and you and you point it at yourself, you compare the airflow without and with. Interestingly enough, the airflow is actually greater when the air is slightly baffled and directed like this, which is really interesting. Which is interesting because it gets someone thinking about these issues with side fans like this and bringing in air, fresh air directly through the side of the case like that. So we have a 70 millimeter CPU fan with a 140 feeding it lots and lots of air so it doesn't have, doesn't have to spin as fast. But here's the problem. You have a 140 millimeter fan, but most of the cooling is needed around here. That's why I'm messing around with things like filters and baffles and stuff like that. I did try a direct pipe going from the side fan to cover up the CPU fan, but it actually damaged the cooling because some of the heat that radiates off the processor radiates in was radiating into the pipe and conflicting with the airflow. So it actually was better and a cleaner looking case for me to just have the, the fans blowing at the processor instead of having a direct air pipe or direct uh, hose, so to speak, going straight to the processor. I probably still have it on the floor around here somewhere. If you, uh, I probably still have it on. Actually, yeah, I do. Here it is. It's uh, one of these deals. It looks like the kind of thing, like some kind of bullhorn or something. And this obviously extends, but it's only a hundred. It's only a hundred and twenty millimeter though. So, but even with the fan adapter, I actually tested the airflow and actually felt less air with this than without it. So, for temperature's sake, we've got this going on. Unfortunately, there's one more thing, and I mentioned the case becoming obsolete. There's only one more thing that needs to be addressed here, and that is where I place the drives. So I thought that because of this EVGA GTX 760 video card, I thought that the heat from this was so great that some of it was making its way to the front and radiating outwards. Well, stupid me, duh. One very important thing that I forgot, hard drives give off heat. So now the question remains, what do we do? What do we do? Because we have these two drives right next to each other. If you remove this Staples cable tie thing, um, the closest thing to cable management that this case has, I probably should try and see if I can find a way I can move some of these wires and cables around so that they're not impeding the airflow. But any, then again, I have my intakes on the side. One of the problems with having side intakes, because of course this fan or this case only supports 80 millimeter intakes, including, and I also removed the drive cage too, or the fan holder from this drive cage. So one of the problems I ran into was big wide video card had to put the drives right next to each other. Looks like I'm going to have to move the drives again because the uh, the drives being right next to each other causes them to heat up so much that air, that heat actually starts coming out the front. 
So not a good thing. Definitely not a good thing for the drives. I want to see if I can spread them out a little. Maybe move these SSDs around so that I have the SSDs down here. And then say, well, this is the thing, though. This is the thing, though. I have one empty three and a half in the middle here, and then I have the card reader up top. So what I'm thinking of doing is maybe leaving this drive where it is and moving this drive up to the bottom slot on here, and then moving the SSD down to here where it might have a better chance of fitting versus the tight video card, or just find some place to put it. The big thing I need to do is spread out these hard drives so they can stop cooking, so that this one on the bottom can stop cooking the one on top. So some more drive moving to do. Of course, this case is this case has had a good run, but unfortunately, this is, the design is just woefully outdated. There's only 120 millimeter fan support, which I'm kind of overriding a bit with these 140s. But as you can see, if things get any bigger, the door is not going to be able to shut no matter what I do. So yeah, this case is on its last legs. It was a great design in the early 2000s, but now not so much. Just got to rearrange some of these drives in order to clean up this little heat issue that I've got that where all the heat is centralized in this case. It would probably be better for both the drives if they were further apart. And I can't put front case fans on this either because if I add the fan holder thing back to this drive cage, both of those hard drives move over an inch and the bottom one will literally be brushing against the video card. Plus, I'd, so I wouldn't be able to cool both fans because one of them would still have to move. So it's just... Newer cases are wider, they natively support bigger fans, and they also support putting the drives in going sideways so, they, so that this problem doesn't happen. Just one of the many ways in which this case design is definitely outdated, sadly. But do I really feel like spending over $100 just for a better case? Or should I save the better case for the next time I build a new system? And if that's the case, huh, saying case a lot here, when am I going to build one? I'm not all that interested in the Intel Haswell processors right now because the Intel Haswell processors have an issue with their heat spreader. There's crappy thermal paste underneath the heat spreader instead of proper solder, to proper thermal solder or something like that that would do a better job of transferring the heat. But yeah, there's some issues with the heat spreaders and some of those uh, newer processors. So I would probably, I'm probably just going to stick with AMD for now. Plus, I'm not a big fan of the pins on the motherboard sockets that Intel processors have had for the past several years. So I'm thinking of sticking with AMD if they can come up with a decent processor. The FX9000 series don't really impress me all that much. If I got a new, if I built a new system, it would probably run off of an 8350. Yeah. An 8350s would only be marginally better than this 1090T from a couple of years ago. Good old computers. I don't know why processors had to stagnate so much, but what are you going to do? Last thing I did, as part of the whole rubber thing, <laughs> here we go with the rubber jokes again, I actually wound up buying proper rubber feet for this case so it can stop scratching the furniture with those stupid plastic things and maybe cut down on the vibration noise just a tad. So here's the net result of all of this. Temps in the 20s and 30s on idle on power saver mode, they get up into like the 40s and 50s on full load. I'm wondering now if maybe replacing some thermal paste might do, uh, some, might do some things as well because I'm actually using a stock cooler with this thing and that's got who knows what for thermal paste. Plus the thermal paste was pre-applied. So I'm wondering if that's the equivalent of like applying thermal paste with the spread method. The P method, or the dot method, actually can be a lot more effective. And of course we can throw in some better thermal paste as well. So I'm wondering how much more I can drive down this temperature before I start messing around with third-party coolers. Anyways, 82 out. CPU is at 27 idle. GPU is at 35 idle. Well, now 34 idle, but yeah. So there's the temps we're looking at. So that is the net result of all of this messing around with computers that I've done for how long now? I've probably torn apart this computer more times in the last couple of weeks than in the last couple of years, but... Eh, yeah, well, nerd's gotta be a nerd sometime, sometime, especially when finally getting out of some long-running job doldrums and actually having some disposable income again for the first time in years. Ah, normal life is sweet. Till next time, this is Multimedia J. Signing off. 
Thanks for stopping by. Thank you.